with um, disabilities or, or sick illnesses. When you're laying there, you know, and you're you're weighing what you know against what you don't know, or what you're told against, you know, what you believe. You know, you you think you make yourself promises. You know, you make your, and my promise was that if I was ever able to walk again, if I was ever able to go back to a normal life, that I would spend the rest of my life, you know, studying the concept of the brain and mind, and that's what I've been doing. Right. And did you go back and see your doctors afterwards? And I called the medical director of the yeah. of the hospital, <clears throat> and we had a fine conversation, and he was happy, uh, but. You know, this was outside of convention. I think that even if I attended a patient who came to my office and I took x-rays and I saw those broken bones, I would consider Harrington rod surgery for them as well. But this was me, you know. <laughs> and when it was you're, your body. And yeah. it was my body. Yeah. And so for me, I, I had to back up and reevaluate everything I, I knew, and I'm, I'm happy that I did. Absolutely. So you went back to your practice. And then I think after that you did, you studied neuroscience, was that right? Well, I, I took a spiritual path, you know, I, I took a strong spiritual path and, and, and I think what's happening in the contemporary world right now is that there's a, there's a merging of, of traditional spiritual texts with scientific information because our research is getting so good and our instrumentation and our technology is improving that I think that presently science is becoming the new language of the spiritual realm in the non-religious sense. And so you can't study spirituality at this point without having an interest in finding out what's going on in the brain, the mind, uh, and, and consciousness. So uh, that led me into a very strong interest in what happens in the brain when we what, and what's the subconscious mind and the conscious mind. And so, you know, I started, you know, in my spiritual quest, I started studying people who had spontaneous remissions of diseases, huh. and I wanted yeah. a, ten years worth of accumulating data. And when I started studying that information and making the connection, now, so you you actually have this data, do you? Oh yeah, yeah. It's that would a, make a great book. It's in it's in Evolve. It's the second right. chapter okay. of Evolve. Yeah. Um, that there were four common principles that they had that after yeah. my interviews. Yeah. And so I had to go back to school and, and, and learn neuroscience because it was the most operable and practical explanation to bring it to the most simple, common ways for people to begin to apply to their own life. Right. Yeah. The four principles, you mentioned these four principles actually in the... In the DVD I watched the other night. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just go through the four basic principles? Well, you know, it, it makes total sense. When people have a disease, um, they can't go on business as usual. You can't keep your social agreements and you don't do the things you typically do because, first of all, you're uncomfortable. Second of all, you're worried about your own mortality. And so people, a lot of times, turn inward. It's a common phenomenon. The first thing they had in common is they all believe that there was a spiritual aspect within them that something was giving them life and that again just like me if they could connect with that intelligence and and give it some direction or give it some order and and develop a relationship with it even though you can't see it or taste it or feel it or hear it but it's alive right because it is life and then surrender <clears throat> you know plant the seed and then surrender it and give up your worry and fear and know that this mind would begin to work for you that was the first thing they had in common. Second right. thing was that they began to realize that their 20 years of hatred and their 10 years of pain and suffering and their 30 years of uh, anger towards their father or whatever emotion that they had memorized was really the reason for their disease, that it was that strong emotion that they lived by every single day that was killing them. And they had to break the habit of being themselves. They had to forgive and they had to let go and, and unlearn some emotions that they had memorized that became part of their personality. You see, people would say, well, a lot of it is genetic. It's fact that, you know, they, they got some disease because their father had it, their grandfather had it. That's true, it is genetic, but they used to say that it's, it was genes that caused disease. And then 
25 years ago, Ian, they said, well, no, it's the environment that pushes the genetic buttons that cause disease. Now we're saying it's the internal environment that is affected by the external environment that pushes the genetic buttons that cause disease. Because why is it that two factory workers can work side by side, exposed to a carcinogenic chemical in the factory, one gets cancer and the other doesn't? Surely there must be some internal order there that allows that to take place. So, so um, yeah, there is a genetic component, but what turns the genes on is the question. Yeah, they're going to be more easily turned on, possibly, in some people than others, and people a little more sensitive. Well, the latest research presently shows that anger, aggression, fear, anxiety, pain, suffering, those survival states yeah. dysregulate and downregulate the genes to create disease. Now, the question is, if we know that we can turn on those states just by thought alone. If our thoughts make us sick, is it possible that our thoughts can make us well? And yeah. there's research now that's beginning to show that in fact there is a, there's a way to do that. And so these people began to realize that their thoughts and feelings and the cycle of thinking and feeling and feeling and thinking, the redundancy of the same emotion kept pushing the same genetic button that created disease. Now they didn't say it that way. What they said was, I'm killing myself over something that for the last 20 years uh, this 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 hatred or this anger hasn't done anything but hurt myself and so they began to look at how they could um, change that so that was the second thing they had in common a profound moment because that surrendering process is saying I no longer want to be the same person I was they get fed up with it basically don't yeah. they? you reach a point yeah. where your back is against yeah. the wall and yeah. you say uh, I'm going to die if I keep this up. Yeah. Uh, now, these people, by the way, a lot of them were taking medications and, and, and doing therapies, and they were either staying the same or they were getting worse. So they knew that they were heading down a track where yeah. they had to all of a sudden get serious and, and, yeah. and re, 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 rethink a, a lot of things. Now, the third thing they had in common, which I thought was one of the most fascinating, was that um, they said to themselves, now that I've surrendered this part of myself I want to reinvent myself how would I how would a happy person be how what would I have to do to be happy how would I have to think what would I have to change about myself to be in joy who do I know in my life that I want to be like they started to ask themselves some profound questions and they were smart enough to wait for the answers instead of turning on the TV or getting on the cell phone mm -hmm. or doing what we typically do to distract us they sat down and they contemplated how would I have to be? And as they began to answer the question, what they didn't know was happening was that they were changing their brain and their mind just by thinking differently. They were forcing the brain to fire in new sequences and new patterns and new combinations. And whenever we make the brain work differently, we're making a new mind. Mind is the brain in action or the brain at work. So they were right. beginning to change their mind. Let's. Uh, what I'm interested in, just bring a dimension to this now, Joe. So if we come back a stage, maybe that's not the right terminology, but we just, or we widen the picture. Where do those new thoughts come from? Because they don't necessarily come from in here. Great it's question. It's almost like Great they're question. coming from out here. There's a couple ways that it happens, Ian. First way, <coughs> if you wanted to take on the qualities and characteristics of Mahatma Gandhi, you would read his autobiography or Churchill. You would want to know what is it about that person, character-wise or virtue-wise, that you adored or appreciated. So they accumulated knowledge. Every time we learn something new, we make new connections in the brain. So as they learn new things, they provided the raw materials to begin to organize a new ideal of self. The second thing that happens is that in the brain, the sum of the parts is greater than the whole. So when we begin to ask those type of questions, those I call those frontal lobe questions, the newest and most evolved part of the brain called the frontal lobe finally yes. wakes up and turns on. And because it has connections to all other parts of the brain, what it can do very well is it can take all of the knowledge we've intellectually learned and all the experiences that we've had, and it could seamlessly paste them together in a nonlinear way to make or reinvent a new idea. That's what invention is. So they began to use